Um, hello, welcome back. Um, I am the uh, session chair, Mike Nagib, uh, assistant professor in the physics and engineering physics department. Um, our first keynote speaker um, today is uh, Dr. Susan Sandman, a reader in biomaterial and biomedical science at the University of Brighton and UK. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Sa uh, Dr. Sandman to start sharing her screen. Hi, that should have me sharing my screen. I just need to check that uh, you can all see that. Let's take a look at the chat. Okay, that's great. So you can all see. So greetings from the University of Brighton on the south coast of the UK. Um, I have to say it would be nicer to be seeing you all in person, but um, for now, we'll have to make uh, do with um, a virtual conference. So thank you very much to the organizers for, um, for organizing it virtually and for inviting me to speak. Uh, so let's just, oh, I seem to be frozen. Okay, so uh, in brief overview, um, I'm going to be presenting to you about some of our work um, generally on nanostructured absorbance and extracorporeal devices, uh, looking particularly at life-threatening infection. When I looked at the abstract and the title I had submitted, um, it was obvious that uh, at the time I was in lockdown mode and thinking about how we could uh, turn uh, the work that we do on absorbance to looking at the treatment of um, COVID-19 related things. So that was obviously on my mind when I submitted this abstract. So I've um, had a look at our work and we'll be talking about um, the way we've looked at the use of absorbents to treat life-threatening infection, um, particularly focusing on cytokine storm and sepsis. And then going on to look at some of the work we've done on vaccines and extracorporeal device applications generally, particularly focusing on augmentation of dialysis and artificial organs. And then finally, as um, a tease for um, so three of the posters that some PhD students are presenting on vaccines and ophthalmic smart lens devices, some work we're doing um, with an intra intraocular lens company and uh, with Professor Gogotzi on accommodative intraocular lenses, particularly focusing on device failure and uh, direction we're taking in terms of uh, treating hyperinflammation and also the use of these devices potentially um, in terms of early uh, disease diagnostics. And over here you can see um, uh, the first time I looked down, uh, I just find my pointer, sorry. Uh, so the first time I looked down the microscope at the interaction of maxines and uh, cells, and when I saw that uh, cells like to grow on maxines, I knew that I would enjoy uh, working with maxines as, as a material. So I'm uh, and our group are interested in um, what we term biointerfacial phenomena, and that's the interaction of materials with biological systems, in particular uh, cells um, and tissue. So let's go on to look to talk about adsorbents in extracorporeal systems generally. So the principle of an extracorporeal adsorbent is that that it filters the blood of unwanted toxins. And here we can see um, a simple hemoperfusion cartridge filled uh, with an adsorbent, in this case, activated carbon beads. Blood um, is perfused through the system, um, detoxified and returned uh, to the patient uh, cleanse. There are uh, many variations of extracorporeal blood perfusion. Um, they're all based on dialysis filtration or adsorption. And we've particularly focused on the use of adsorbents uh, to, to treat uh, chronic kidney uh, failure, um, but also on um, uh, sepsis. Um, adsorbents have been used for many years uh, to treat acute poisoning. 
So we, we've looked at a range of nanostructured and smart polymers for uh, blood detoxification and here you can see um, some of them. So for, for um, many uh, years we've looked at the use of um, activated carbons synthetically derived from phenolic resin. Um, we've looked at the creation of porous domains that allow removal of difficult to remove toxins. Um, particularly uh, cytokines and we've also looked at the creation of um, uh, bead based but also monolith type systems where you extrude um, and it reduces the complications of using a bead based system. Uh, we've, we've looked at also macroporous hydrogels. I was very interested in the previous talk and, and the use of maxines within um, hydrogel systems. So these are made uh, using um, ice crystal porogens as cryogels. And we've looked at using them uh, for the treatment of life-threatening infection, in this case, uh, targeting um, as an exemplar um, anthrax infection um, and binding antibodies to the surface of, of the cryogels for blood perfusion and uh, targeting um, uh, toxins particularly relevant uh, to anthrax. But this type of system could be used um, for other um, in infections as well. And then also turning to two-dimensional materials, in particularly looking at graphenes and maxines, and also the way we can incorporate these two-dimensional materials into other composite and hybrid systems. So here you can see um, a, micro, uh, um, a photograph of uh, cryogel, which has um, had uh, maxine incorporated um, into it and looking at uh, perfusion of that system. So if we go on to look at how we can use adsorbents in life-threatening infections, such, a, such as the current uh, COVID-19 infection. Um, so cytokine storm is a part of the body's um, immune response to any invading pathogen. Um, so uh, the pathogen uh, will interact with cells, in this case, um, alveolar epithelial cells in the lungs, and it will activate uh, via different means. Um, firstly, macrophages that are residing there, and those then will trigger other immunocompetent cells um, to release cytokines. And cytokines are proteins um, that will then um, mount this uh, immune response um, and it, it, an inflammatory response, uh, which will then targeting, shutting down and controlling this infection. However, uh, for a subset of patients, um, those patients uh, will, will go into what is termed cytokine storm. And that is when there is this hyperinflammatory response, which becomes unresolved. And uh, consequently, um, you get um, hyperstimulation via too many cytokines produced and uh, you will have um, hyperactivation of inflammatory cascades, which will then cause tissue damage. You can then become susceptible to um, other infections um, and progress towards sepsis and multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, and um, in some cases, uh, obviously death. Um, and it, it's interesting to note that the different systems of the body that are then affected by this tissue damage, um, including uh, the liver, the kidneys in acute kidney injury, but also the eye um, and the gastrointestinal tract, so the gut. And in particular, IL-6 has been um, uh, flagged as a key cytokine, as a marker for disease severity and uh, linked to hyperinflammation and cytokine stormers and is used um, as a risk factor um, of death for patients who then go into acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome. So that gives you the background of infection associated uh, cytokine storm. So when we talk about extracorporeal blood purification to treat this type of infection, so the literature is currently um, uh, present to, to propose extracorporeal systems for the treatment of um, raised cytokine levels in severe COVID-19 infection. Uh, and these are um, a range of adsorbent devices and there's literature um, from Ronco et al um, talking about uh, different systems, sorbents, resins, hollow fiber membranes, and they target these uh, toxins, which are endotoxins, uh, cytokines, um, and also offering organ support. Um, currently, NICE guidelines um, suggest more evidence is required to assess efficacy. So here you can see just the range of different um, organs that are supported 
um, by um, these types of systems um, and suggested uh, potentially um, uh, for, for treatment of this subset of patients who go into cytokine storm. So I'm just gonna make sure I can keep an eye on my uh, clock here. So um, where is there scope to improve um, these adsorptions? Um, well, potentially in augmentation of dialysis and portable systems for acute and chronic care, um, but also in the uh, development of bioartificial organs for detoxification using cells. Um, so here on, um, uh, we, you can see an example of this. So this is um, part of a PhD students work in our lab and looking at bioartificial liver. Um, and these support, these are cell, cell constructs um, which um, have a matrix which supports cells, in this case liver cells, which um, are used in the treatment of um, experimentally um, targeting the treatment of uh, liver, liver failure. So taking over the, the um, failing liver function. However, um, the, it's, it's difficult to keep um, highly metabolizing, cell, metabolizing cells like uh, hepatocytes um, within this system. And so there's a suggestion that we could use adsorbents to protect these cells. So that's the second approach. But really, um, there are many uh, devices that could be used um, to remove um, pathogen-derived pathogen and metabolic toxins, driving hyperinflammation um, to replace organ function um, in uh, organ failure. So um, what do we need to target when we're talking about the removal of toxins in sepsis? Um, well, we've looked at a range of carbon adsorbents, um, including carbide derived carbons and activated carbons. And um, we're, we're targeting these difficult to remove toxins. And these are the um, high molecular weight cytokines, um, bacterial endotoxins, and then albumin bound toxins. So currently dialysis is very good at, at uh, removing small and water soluble molecules, but not very good at removing uh, and, and not removing at all these larger molecules. So we're targeting um, those and particularly looking at um, porosity. So this is just some early work we did um, looking at um, activated carbons and we looked at a range of pore size distribution internally. So we know these have a huge surface area, but what we found was that microporous carbons um, did not remove cytokine, but then when we shifted um, the porosity range up into the meso macroporous range, um, we saw uh, good removal of these large cytokines of so TNF and IL-6. Um, so we then wanted to go on and look at whether we could turn these into um, uh, monolith type systems uh, to reduce the complications associated with the use of beads. And we were able to scale up um, these um, systems uh, to, to retain this internal meso macroporosity um, um, that, that we um, required to remove um, these cytokines. Uh, and when we went on to look particularly at augmentation of kidney dialysis, um, here you can see the principles of dialysis where you have blood um, which uh, flows against in countercurrent to dialysis fluid and you have smaller more soluble toxins moving across. Um, however, some toxins remain which are linked to pathophysiology. And these are the large cytokines and some of the albumin bound toxins. So we set up an experimental system spiking uh, with toxins and showed removal over time and then tested this system in a small animal model for safety. And I haven't included all the data here, but you can see that there is um, a reduction in um, albumin bound key uremic toxins. But also, if you remember IL-6, that key cytokine, there was also a reduction in cytokine over time. So, um, what do we conclude from this? Well, adsorption of difficult to remove inflammatory molecules linked to hyperinflammation, sepsis, and um, organ support failure. Um, in this case, influenced by this is significant internal nanoprosity, um, occurs predominantly for um, these uh, systems uh, via hydrophobic interactions. But what does this mean uh, for maxines with these interesting properties, huge lateral surface area, surface chemistry, and hydrophilicity? So when we went on um, in a project um, with Professor Gagotzi's uh, group to look at uh, graphene adsorption of cytokines from blood, 
Um, we started with um, graphenes, and um, this was before we'd begun looking at, um, at maxines. And um, we uh, looked whether graphenes could be incorporated into some kind of system to augment dialysis um, and showed um, that that graphenes were actually very good at removing cytokines. So I'm just trying to keep an eye on the, the chat. Yeah, apologies for the problems with the, the, the video. Um, so, so we looked at uh, um, graphene and graphene PTFE films and looked at whether we could retain the, the adsorptive properties um, of these systems. And here you can see the results for IL-8, IL-6 and TNF. And um, you can see that the graphene um, nanoplates were actually very good at removing um, peak gram quantities of cytokines. So in every instance, um, cytokines were removed by uh, the graphene nanoplatelets for IL-6 and TNF. However, when it was incorporated into um, the films, we lost the adsorptive capacity. So the kinetics slowed down. Um, we still had an adsorption of IL-8 over time and IL-6, but very little of the larger cytokine TNF. So it still is a, a, challenging, uh, a challenging aspect of incorporation of these two-dimensional materials um, into, into some kind of um, method by which we can present it to the body in a biocompatible and, and efficacious way um, because incorporation into films often blocks uh, the surface area and the pores that we want um, for absorption. So turning now to look at um, maxines and extracorporeal systems. So what does all this mean for maxines? So in order to um, look at whether these materials can be um, used in dialysis augmentation for artificial organs and to improve the portability of these systems, uh, we need to look at whether maxines are cytotoxic. So some basic premises of the use of a biomaterial in the body. We need to look at whether maxines are hemocompatible and whether they do anything, whether they remove some of the toxins that we're most interested in. Um, so we, we firstly, um, began to look at maxines on a, a joint project, um, British Council Global Innovation Initiative project with Professor Gagotzi's group and um, through an exchange of um, students and research staff, uh, we began to look um, in addition to the work on graphene at, at maxines and in particular whether maxines could be used to absorb urea um, and in, uh, uh, with an application to the wearable artificial kidney. So here you can see um, uh, from um, uh, Professor uh, Gura, um, this is a schematic of the premise of one of the wearable artificial kidneys, um, where you have um, a miniaturization of the system. Um, patients who are, have chronic kidney disease um, and are in need of hemodialysis will um, tend to be hospital based um, three times a week and hooked up. Um, to dialysis for four hours. So the idea is that portability um, will improve um, treatment options for patients. And so there are many challenges in making this portable. This is the dialyzer cartridge here. This is the blood system. And over here is a system of, of adsorbent materials designed to um, regenerate the, dialys the dialysate uh, for the patients. At the moment, um, the process of removing urea, which is a key molecule a toxin that builds up in kidney failure, is to use urease to convert it to the highly toxic ammonia and then um, to um, absorb that um, onto a resin cartridge. There's also some carbon in here as well. Um, and so this project was looking at whether urea could um, be removed by, um, by maxines. And so um, FIAN um, looked particularly um, at uh, these three um, maxines and found that TR3C2 um, was most um, efficacious in um, absorbing uh, urea. And our role in it was to look at um, hemocompatibility um, of the maxines. So these are the results we showed um, looking particularly, so this is a simple 60 minute um, uh, contact assay with um, healthy blood. We looked at the intrinsic clotting cascade. So does Maxine induce coagulation? Um, we looked at whether it takes out clotting factors from the blood, whether it causes hemolysis and uh, whether there is platelet activation. Um, and we found um, that um, there was a slight rise um, in um, the intrinsic clotting uh, 
cascade. There was a, a, a slight uh, increase in, in clotting time, um, but there was no uh, significant impact on, on any of these factors of um, hemoincompatibility. We went on also to look at TI3C2 um, cytotoxicity. Um, and um, we did that using um, simple MTS and LDH assays and also live dead staining uh, with confocal microscopy. And you can see the results for multi-layered maxine and delaminated um, de maxine here. So um, we showed over a, a concentration range up to 200 microgram per mil that the materials uh, were, uh, um, were not cytotoxic. They didn't um, lyse the cells and the cells um, were um, alive after incubation compared to um, uh, this, uh, the control. So we also looked at apoptosis studies um, using a flow cytometry based assay um, and, and this, here you can see the results. Um, so um, results here for uh, Maxine's, sorry, my pointer's doing strange things. Um, so um, we looked at a concentration uh, range and a, a time range up to 24 hours um, compared to the positive control, which was camptothecin. And you can see a nice decline um, in uh, live cell fraction over time for the positive control um, and no change in um, the maxines. So maxines do not induce um, apoptosis. I've thrown this um, early data um, from one of the, our PhD students, Natalie and Noriega here, um, because it's, it, it addresses an interesting issue, which was there is um, some differences in the literature around cytotoxicity of maxines. Um, and we wondered whether it was to do um, with flake size. So Natalia at the start of her PhD has started to look particularly um, at, a, at a very careful analysis of the impact of flake size on cytotoxicity profile. And this is um, the early, early un unpublished um, data, but I wanted to include it here to show that it's an important issue to address, to know the flake size that we're working with. Because if you think about the size of cells, cells are made up of, of nanomachinery effectively. So when you're working with nano sized materials, you need to think about the interaction of those materials uh, with membrane receptors, with intracellular pathways, um, and, um, and that could be an issue. So Natalia, um, carefully, you can see the, the distribution, um, size distribution of the materials here, um, looking at three different uh, flake sizes, and again, looking at cytotoxicity assay, um, assays of a concentration range up to 350 microgram per mil, and has um, shown no difference um, in the cytotoxicity profile of those materials. So it appears that flake size doesn't make a difference to the uh, cytotox cytotoxicity. We also wanted to go on and look at what um, interaction occurred uh, with maxines and cytokines. So we'd already shown that um, graphene's removed cytokines, so what about maxines? Um, so um, we looked at using a, a monocyte model, THP1s, um, in um, cell culture. Um, you can stimulate these cells with an, a bacterial endotoxin, a lipopolysaccharide, um, to produce cytokines. And it's a really nice model to look at whether um, materials interact uh, with cytokines to remove them. So in this assay, you basically stimulate, this is the cell here, you stimulate the THP1 cell with lipopolysaccharide. It binds um, via, uh, to a binding protein, then via toll-like receptors, upregulate uh, the production of inflammatory cytokines, which are then produced and you can measure them with ELISA. So this shows you the um, results um, and you can see the results for multilayer and delaminated maxine. So with regard to urea, multilayered maxine can remove urea. It's a small, highly water soluble molecule. And um, with these larger um, molecules, multilayered maxines don't um, absorption, absorb them significantly other than for IL-8. However, the delaminated maxines remove um, IL-8 in entirety um, remove IL-6 and um, some 
um, TNF, although not um, as significantly as, as the graphene. When we go and look at the cell models, so that's, a, that's direct contact. So that's spiking the plasma, incubating with materials, looking at removal. When we looked at the THP1 model, so um, incubating the cells with um, LPS stimulation and then looking at production of cytokines, um, you can see that um, maxines uh, prevented the production of detectable levels of IL-8, IL-6, and also most of, of, T, uh, most of TNF um, as well. So what does this mean? Well, um, when you look at the potential mechanisms, it doesn't look like Maxine's um, binds um, significantly to LPS and, and prevents it working, um, but it um, and it, it, it does remove some um, of uh, the cytokines that are produced, but not all, and not enough to explain the result. Um, so perhaps Maxine removes by absorption some of the cytokines, but also gets in the way um, and actively antagonizes binding of lipopolysaccharide to um, uh, the LPS receptor, so the TLR4 receptor. Um, so um, this is, these are the tentative mechanisms that we're proposing and, and looking into. So um, in summary of um, the use of vaccines for extracorporeal and portable organ replacement strategies, um, we've seen that vaccines were not cytotoxic, um, that what they were hemocompatible um, in the um, experimental conditions and protocols that um, we were using, um, and that in a portable system, um, there's potential for use um, to, um, particularly in this case for uh, urea adsorption, um, but also for, in, in other portable organ uh, replacement systems, there's room for um, different types of, adsorp uh, of adsorbent um, um, to, uh, uh, to, to fit within um, a system. And we've also shown that maxines reduce cytokine production um, in uh, this cell model following bacterial LPS induced cytokine stimulation. So a potential role for maxines is adsorb as adsorbents and the treatment of life-threatening infection, but also to repress hyperinflammation in other systems to treat chronic, um, um, co chronic conditions. So finally, um, and, and as I draw to a close, I just want to touch on Maxine's and um, Smart Lens devices. Um, so we talked about um, Maxine's and, and targeting particularly life-threatening infection and infection, but there are other um, um, applications uh, for Maxine's um, and, and targeting hyperinflammation, both um, for chronic disease, but also in the diagnosis of um, in the diagnosis of infection. And um, so we've been looking at, uh, with, with a company called Rainer Intraocular Lenses, we've been looking at the use of Maxine's and ophthalmic um, smart lens devices, um, starting uh, with Emma Ward's PhD, looking at accommodating intraocular lens um, design. So here's uh, the lens in the eye. You'll all be familiar with the development of cataracts and the use of intraocular lenses to treat cataracts. It's a very successful um, surgery. Um, with um, minimal com complications that we'll get to later. Um, we, we've been looking at, um, secondly, branching into um, repression of hyperinflammatory response to tissue injury in a, a second PhD leading on from Emma's work, and also looking at the use of these devices to detect biomarkers. So in Emma's work, she's looked particularly, and I'll just touch on these as I draw to a close because I can see the timings um, up. Um, in Emma's work, she's looked at spin coating um, layered um, Maxine onto lenses, looking at um, balancing transparency and conductivity to allow for accommodation of the lens. So normal intraocular lenses, you lose accommodative focus when you have the surgery. So you're no longer able to focus on near and far vision. So the purpose is um, to replace that accommodative focus using Maxine based um, optoelectronic options. We've done some biological studies uh, showing that in that ocular environment the lenses are safe um, and Emma's got some nice work and I'll point you towards a, her paper that's just been published and her poster where she's shown feasibility of this approach. So here you can see um, she's um, 
incorporated the MAT scenes into a liquid crystal system and on application of uh, an electrical um, current you can see out of focus becomes in focus and it's a really nice um, proof of concept study um, and I'll point you towards her work. Um, so the second poster is looking at um, Maxine to reduce the inflammatory complications leading to device failure and cataract surgery. So cataract surgery occurs, posterior capsular opacification um, is the primary cause of device failure and we're looking at whether Maxine's can incorporate some kind of element um, that will elute and will repress um, the production of um, this um, posterior capsule opacification from um, cells that incorporate behind the material and cause a, a new, a secondary cataract to form. And I'll point you towards Grace's poster to um, see more detail about that. And then finally, looking at um, uh, Natalia's poster, she's beginning to look at the, um, the use of these devices um, to look at ophthalmic biosensing for early detection of disease. And interestingly, um, it may be that these uh, lens-based systems could be used to uh, as early detector, detection of, of viral pathogens. And there's been some literature surrounding uh, COVID, early detection of COVID-19. Uh, uh, in addition to sensors systems with maxines looking at detecting um, dopamine. So early days for biomedical applications for maxines, um, borrowed this from Babak and Yuri, um, early days for these applications, but, but many materials um, and um, many opportunities to develop um, these further. And I'll finish with my concluding slide um, which is we've looked at Maxine potential in extracorporeal devices to target cytokines and to augment artificial organs. We've looked at Maxine's in ophthalmic smart lens devices to treat hyperinflammation, particularly returning accommodative focus in intraocular lenses. So thank you very much. Um, I'll finish with my acknowledgement slide um, and hand over for questions. Thank you so much for your very interesting presentation and it, um, it had some good educational aspect to me. Uh, so we have actually multiple questions. Uh, I try to group them. Um, there are questions about the Maxine. Is, there, is oxidation as a problem in, in all of these applications? Sorry, I'm just gonna, I can see that no one can see me. So I'm just gonna, um, I think, no, I'm not going to be able to. So I was going to try and take out the. Um, uh, I was going to try and take out the, uh, the background. Okay. That's okay. Um, so um, is, is oxidation <laughs> Sorry, a concern? Carry on. Oxidation. So um, probably the the very first. Yeah. So yes, oxidation is, is a concern with some of the early materials that. Um, we, we were using. In terms of our experimental processes, um, do you mean um, long-term in the biomedical device or yes. in these results? Okay, so long-term. Um, so um, potentially, I think we'd have to do, do the experiments to see um, what happens to, um, the, to, to the device following incubation. We haven't actually, um, we tend to use uh, cell-based models um, and we haven't actually looked at the material post the experiment. We've looked at what happens with the, bi the biological toxin we're trying to um, measure, but we haven't looked at whether oxidation is an issue for the materials. It would actually be quite difficult to do because whenever you put a material in a biological system, first thing that happens is it's coated with protein. Um, so it's working out whether um, it's an issue or not, or whether the interaction with the biological system, it, it doesn't matter in the same way as say it would in a different application. Mm -hmm. But it's a good, it's an interesting question uh, to consider. So, and, and this also um, follow up with a question about the lifespan of artificial kidney. And um, does it have any side effects? So the, the side effects from? Uh, this is a, it's a question is what is the lifespan of artificial kidney and how authentic about side effects? Um, I believe for using it um, as a way to clean the blood. 
Okay, so um, it, if, the, if, if it's talking about the maxi, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the portable system that, that I showed there, um, it's actually in the dialysis, dialysis uh, in the regeneration section um, for the dialysate. So it will not see the blood in the same way as direct contact devices would. We've shown that it doesn't look like it will do any harm in terms of human compatibility, but you also don't want two dimensional nanomaterials um, in your body heading to your liver. Um, some of the early issues with um, the activated carbon in the early 20th century when it was beginning to be developed for medical applications where you ended up with carbon flakes effectively in the lungs and that was an issue. So there are lots of, and I, and I, I, I know that there are some groups doing animal studies at the moment looking at those compatibility issues, but in our, in our hands, in our um, ex vivo type um, experiments, it's not showing any harm. Yeah, so actually you answered another question I was, go was uh, asked by one of the audiences about uh, getting the vaccine into the body and this will how problematic this could be. Um, there's a question about how, do you how did you measure the flake size in the experiment um, on the flake size dependent? So flake size was measured using um, DLS. DLS. And, and what other factors in addition to flake size? If, because you showed that flake size doesn't have a big role in the cytotoxicity. Um, what else can lead to those different numbers reported by different groups? Um, difference, it, it's a good question. Um, and we've looked at um, some issues. Um, so some of the things that we have found have been to do with processing of uh, the maxine and uh, residual, um, uh, residual synthesis uh, materials still present in the system and actually it's not maxine killing the cells or the bacteria it's the um, that that was our early um, mistakes <laughs> um, and I'm not suggesting that, 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 that that's the reason um, in the in the literature um, some of it could be differences in certainly differences in parameters in the experimental setup and that's why I think it's really important um, for us to um, agree um, the experimental parameters and also in the methodology reporting very clearly okay exact what is the exact maxine you're using how is it made what is the physical characterization of it in addition to the biological characterization of it and having that at, certainly in the supplementary information is very is very useful and we're trying to be more careful about how we how we do that yes thank you so much this is a perfect answer um so uh, we are running out of time. Uh, we have many more questions, but unfortunately we are running out of time again. So our next uh, speaker will start in two minutes. So stay tuned, thank you. So you're looking at a compound that we've created here at Drexel called Maxine. We discovered it in 2011, but have recently learned how to make it behave like conductive clay. This stuff has the potential to replace the electrode material found in supercapacitors and even batteries. In the past, to create pure maxine films, you'd have to etch max phase with hydrofluoric acid, wash it, intercalate it with dimethyl sulfoxide, sonicate it, centrifuge it, and filter it. We've managed to cut the process down to just the etching step. Now, we simply react max phase with an etchant made from much safer acid and a salt, and after washing, we're left with a clay-like material that we can shape any way that we want, even rolling it out into a film. After drying, it's highly conductive. Not only is the process easier and safer, but electrodes that took us only five minutes to roll out have shown a 200% increase in capacitance over our previous reports. Sometimes the simplest ways are the best, and it's one of the many great things only happening at Drexel. Hello, welcome back. Uh, I am Michael Naguib, uh, an assistant professor in the physics and engineering physics at Tulane University. I am the 
session chair for today. Um, our second keynote speaker for this session is Dr. Thierry Ossi, uh, uh, professor at University of Grenoble uh, in France. Um, Thierry, um, the floor is yours. Please start sharing your screen. Okay, so here. So do you see the screen? Michael, do, do you see the screen? Because I cannot see myself, so I can use my PowerPoint. Okay, fine. So uh, let me start. So first of all, I, I'd like to thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting us. And uh, I will, uh, um, and today my objective is to convince you that single crystal may be useful for our vaccine research. So uh, here is an outline of uh, my talk. And uh, first of all, let me try to explain what single crystal can be used for. So if you wonder why some people enjoy spending time on growing single crystals, just have a look at those two allotropic forms of carbon. So of course, nobody will deny the historical and economical importance of a piece of core, such as that shown in the right image. However, I think that there is no need to insist upon why the diamond of the left image seems to be more appealing than the piece of core. So one should not marry a woman or a man just for their good looks, but single crystals are useful whenever we want to investigate elementary processes or measure anisotropic properties. And in the case of nanolamellar materials, such as the max phases, there is no doubt that an exact knowledge of their physical properties requires using single crystals. So uh, why are single crystals uh, useful for max phases? So there is indeed no real well identified application and from this point of view, maybe single crystals have no interest at all. However, they are clearly required for investigating physical properties. So if you want to probe the electronic structures, magnetic properties, mechanical properties, or anything else depending on crystal orientation, then you must use single crystals. So in the case of maxines, we may exfoliate well-defined structure. We can uh, investigate two-day compounds which cannot be obtained by chemical exfoliation. And we may use uh, our well-ordered structures in order to clarify elementary processes. So uh, before using uh, our single crystals for research, I would like to describe very briefly the crystal growth process. So I decided to focus on a simple example, which is that of chromium aluminum carbide. So the method we use is a high temperature solution growth. So on the left, you can see a, a plot of uh, an, uh, an isothermal section of the ternary phase diagram at, four, at 1,400 degrees C. So the liquid domain is here, uh, which is a small one, but we can see that it is connected by uh, tie lines to the phase we wish to grow. So in the domain, which is defined by uh, those uh, tie lines, the liquid is in, equi in equilibrium with the max phase. And selecting a composition inside this domain allows us to grow crystals. So here you can see a typical temperature cycle. So to increase the crystal size, we very slowly cool the, down the solution because slow cooling enables austral ripening and the formation of bigger crystals. A good result is uh, shown here, where you can see a sample of chromium aluminum carbide, along with the transmission low pattern, proving that it is a single crystal. So we now grow a substantial number of max phases, and I uh, wrote down a list here. So once we get crystals, we can use them for mechanical exfoliation, and this is the third part of my talk. So uh, the first advantage of uh, using single crystals is that you can use mechanical exfoliation instead of chemical exfoliation. And you can even use the adhesive tape method. 
A second positive point is that we could produce vaccines using phases which cannot be clinically aged, such as a chromium aluminum carbon. The third point is that you can apply the exfoliation process to phases with any air element, such as tin or others, which are for the moment not etchable. Fourth point, you can keep a few air layers, which is important when interesting properties are due to the air atoms. Besides, mechanically exfoliated flakes could be uh, significantly less effective than those obtained by etching. And uh, last, chemically exfoliated crystals can help us to study the elementary processes controlling chemical exfoliation. So those six points motivated our research and I will focus on two particular examples. But before doing this, I would like to give you uh, an example related to the possibility of keeping some air layers. So on the left, you can see the complex structure of a max-like compound, including cerium atoms, which was recently discovered in shopping in Sweden. So uh, this compound is ferromagnetic, and the ferromagnetism is induced by the cerium atoms lying in the middle of the aluminum plates. So this is proved by uh, uh, measuring X-ray magnetic circular decreasing and uh, an absorption age of uh, the aluminum atoms. So we can clearly see that the ferromagnetic moment is induced on them, which can only be induced by the neighboring cerium atoms. So uh, in contrast, molybdenum and carbon atoms do not exhibit any measurable ferromagnetic behavior. So such a system is quite interesting because ferromagnetic interaction competes with the condo effect. That the system is a ferromagnetic condo lattice is proved by the figure on the right, where the universal scaling of the condo magnetoresistance can be nicely fitted by the appropriate model. So if we chemically etch this phase very unfortunately, we will lose the cerium atoms responsible for the magnetism. However, we can use mechanical exfoliation in order to keep some air layers. So I know I wish to describe the mechanical exfoliation process. So in max phases, the, the AMA bounds are much stronger than van der Waals. Yet, as shown here, uh, big crystals with centimeter-sized area can be cleaved using a strong adhesive tape. However, we cannot use those big crystals to produce maxines because due to the weaker anisotropy of the bonds, as compared to graphite, we may also break some carbide bonds. So as a result, after a few exfoliation steps, the crystal surface gets rougher and rougher so that adhesion to the tape is lost. The solution is to start from small and thin crystals, such as the ones which are shown here. So they are obtained by increasing the nucleation inside the solution, and we ultimately select their uh, size by sieve shaking them. So we put 20, 30 such crystals on the tape, and then we repeatedly peel them. And once we get thin flakes, we report them on silicon substrates covered by the top SiO2 insulating layer with a thickness around 30 nanometers. So uh, such a thickness allows us to visualize the flakes using simple optical microscopy. And the typical examples is shown here. So uh, mechanical exfoliation does not eliminate the air atoms at the surface. And uh, we can first check what is remaining on top of the flake. So here, scanning tunneling microscopy, which gives us atomic resolution, has been used to observe the surface topography of a chromium aluminum carbide single crystal after mechanical cleavage in UHV conditions. So as can be seen from the left image, the original hexagonal close packed lattice of chromium atoms is preserved. However, in larger scale image, we observe two distant domains with different apparent heights. So this is interpreted as a result of a surface reconstruction of or clustering of the aluminum atoms. So due to the large contribution of the chromium d orbitals to the density of states at the Fermi level, the chromium rich regions appear closer to the tip. So they are brighter, whereas aluminum disordered or aluminum oxygen clusters appear farther away uh, with a darker color. We may notice that when we cleave a crystal, the aluminum atoms seem to be equally scattered on each of the two cleaved surfaces. So now let us have a look at reported flakes uh, with different compounds. So let us start with chromium aluminum carbide. 
to measure the, the thickness, we use a 24th microscopy. And on the right, AFM topographic image, we can observe thin flakes with lateral dimensions of several microns, whereas their thickness can go down to a very few unit cells. So when you see something like uh, uh, 0.5 L here, this means that the layer thickness is equal to 1.5 times C, where C is the lattice parameter along the hexagon axis. Our second example is uh, V2LC. So the thickness of the flex shown here goes even below one unit cell. So the flex at the bottom right here is just formed by one V2C layer plus the residual aluminum atom at the surface. Third example, TI2SNC. So once again, we can go down to uh, very few unit layers. On the more remarkable, this phase could not be clinically achieved. Our last example is uh, that of the ferromagnetic condor lattice, which I described a few minutes ago. And here again, we can see that uh, very few layer flakes can be obtained with areas of several square microns, which is uh, more than enough for fabricating electron devices with a few layers. So uh, once we get uh, once we get a few layer of flakes reported on silicon substrates, we want to characterize their electrical properties. So the first thing which comes to mind is to process contacts and measure resistivity. An alternative approach is to use techniques not requiring any particular process. One of these techniques has already been extensively used in the case of uh, graphene. So it is called electric force microscopy. So we decided to apply it to our flakes and uh, the results will form the first part of my talk. So since to the best of my knowledge, uh, well, this technique has not been previously applied to Maxian, so I would like to briefly describe it. So first, you use the AFM tapping mode with a mechanically excited AFM tip, and you record the surface topography. Then you lift the tip as a, at, a, at a prescribed height, typically a few tens of uh, or hundreds of nanometers, and you follow a profile which, which always maintains the tip at the uh, same distance from the sample. So you still excite the cantilever mechanically, but uh, now you also uh, apply a voltage between the metallic tip and the sample. So you add a capacitive force on uh, the system. The energy is given by the well-known formula. The force is a gradient of this. So the first formula is not proportional to the derivative of the capacitance. And what is measured is a phase lag <coughs> between the mechanical excitation and the tip oscillation. So this phase is given by the formula here and the voltage appearing in this formula is not restricted to the applied voltage, but must also include the difference of surface potential between the tip and the surface. So we want to compare two different configurations. On the left, we have our flake reported on the SiO2 layer. On the right, the tip is above the naked SiO2 layer. So considering the phase shift, we may expect a contrast between the two configurations through two different ones. So uh, the first one uh, is the square voltage term. And in the case of the flake, we now add or withdraw to the formula the surface potential of the flake at the top and the bottom. But also important, if the flake is metallic and uh, not insulating or semiconducting, we expect an additional contrast, which is that of the term related to the capacitance. So this contrast is expected to be weaker than the first, but in our case, it is quite important because it can be used to probe the metallic nature of the flakes. So let us first have a look uh, at the variation of the phase shift as a function of the flake thickness. So on the left, we see a topographical image, and uh, here we intentionally selected a flake with many terraces and steps with various thicknesses. So the EFM signal is reported on the right image, so it's quite remarkable that no dependence on thickness is observed, which is a prior good indication that the electrical properties of the flakes do not depend much on thickness, and uh, also a good indication that the thin flakes are metallic in exactly the same way as the thicker ones. Um, and even if we go down to ultra thin flakes or uh, one, one unit cell, 
Here again, we can see no appreciable dependence of the EF and signal uh, on the flex signals. A method slightly more complicated than uh, EFM microscopy is called Kelvin prop force microscopy. So here I have no time for describing it in, in detail, but basically what we measure is now the local uh, surface potential value. And here again, we see no difference uh, between flex with a thickness of just uh, one uh, unit cell or to almost 10 unit cells. So all those measurements smell good because they all indicate that the electrical properties of the flex do not depend on the thickness. And uh, this is just what we expect from good needles. So now to prove that definitely, we need to consider the capacitance contrast. So it's possible to compute theoretical values of the capacitance expected, expected in the two possible configuration with or without flake. Uh, the left figure plots a variation of the capacitance versus deep sample distance, and we do expect a substantial contrast for the smaller distances. So validity of the model is, can be assessed by comparing the computed and measured uh, uh, values of the parabola coefficient versus deep sample distance. And uh, as you can see here from the left figure, agreement is indeed excellent, uh, strengthening our confidence in the model used. So now let us go to the proof. So if the flakes are highly metallic, we expect the parabola curvature to be an NC that small dis distances as, as compared with the naked SiO2. So what we do is to measure the parabolas above the flake and above the SiO2. So this is just a graph here. So then we plot the ratio of the two curvatures versus distance. So this is a graph which is shown here on the ratio smaller than one, decreasing when we reduce the tip sample distance definitely proves that flakes are metallic. So this is exactly what can be seen on the left for three different flakes. And we just demonstrated that flakes are all metallic without having to process any electrical contact. Let us leave the FM and go to resistivity measurements. And before addressing the case of our flakes, I would like to say a few words about the scaling of the resistivity of thin needle films with thickness. It's an important reliability concern for downscaling interconnects of integrated circuits. So in the case of copper line, resistivity increasing, increases as, as film thickness is reduced down to the nanometer range. So you can uh, see this increase with a curve in blue on this graph. And there is a number of reasons for this. On the one hand, the uh, grain size scales with thickness on the ground, boundary scattering increases. On the other hand, surface scattering increases too. So um, if we want to consider a, a suitable figure of merit, it is indeed not necessarily a good point to select a material with a high mean free pass. Of course, this gives us a good resistivity, but this resistivity is more prone to a degradation with downscaling. So it's better to obtain a good resistivity thanks to a large carrier density. We therefore need to minimize both the resistivity on the mean free pass, just because a small mean free pass does not degrade as long as the grain size stays larger than it. So the figure of merit chosen by the community is to assess the product of, of the bulk resistivity by the mean free pass. And the goal is to find materials which minimize this quantity. So why are max phases potentially interesting for interconnects? So here is a list. So uh, uh, first of all, the good uh, conductivity is uh, most often due to very high density of states of the Fermi energy, rather than, than to a large mean free pass. Secondly, for many max phases, in-plane transport is much better, and this should reduce surface scattering. So if we take the example of CR to LRC, the measured ratio between in-plane and out-of-plane resistivity is of several hundreds. And the uh, last, their good cohesive energy might drastically reduce electron migration problems. So if we have a look at uh, the graph uh, at the on the right, copper uh, as well, so copper, which is uh, just, just here, uh, as well as many other intermetallics, including max phases, are reported on the graph with the cohesive energy as the abscess on the product of resistivity on mean free pass as the ordinate. So the lower on the more at the right, the better is the compound. And as we can see here, uh, 
many max phases are potentially interesting and in theory much better than proper. So now it's time to go back to our max inflex because they form ideal devices in order to test those uh, concepts. So here are two typical examples of how we process our flex. So once we select flex with uh, appropriate dimensions with a firm, we use conventional EV lithography uh, to design contact patterns adapted to the shape of each flex. We evaporate titanium and gold and get our device uh, after a final lift off process. So we then measure the resistivity uh, with the four prop configuration on the conventional locking mechanism. So first of all, we can check here that as expected for a middle around room temperature, the resistivity is proportional to the temperature. And this fully confirms the conclusion we drew uh, from electric force microscopy. Secondly, what we must check is how the resistivity of our flex compares with that of bulk matrix phases. So this is achieved in the left figure. So here we plot uh, the measure for prop resistivity as a function of uh, flex thickness for several phases. The horizontal lines corresponds to a typical resistivity value measured on the bulk single crystals. So also the sinus flex do not always reach the level of the bulk. It is remarkable that uh, the difference is at most equal to one order of magnitude and even better is reduced to a factor of six for uh, uh, V2 RC and even reduced down to zero in the case of the thinnest measure of chromium aluminum carbide flex. So this is quite an encouraging uh, result, but there is however uh, one strange thing in that figure. So apparent resistivity increases with the thickness or other counterintuitive result, and this is explained by two different factors. So uh, first of all, some max phases are very anisotropic with a better in plane transport and in our case all contacts are realized on top of the flake. So with the current injecting uh, on top of the layer and with such an anisotropy uh, we cannot exclude that current flows mostly through the other layers. As a result using the full thickness as an input leads to an overestimation of the resistivity. On the other hand, we cannot uh, exclude that mechanical exfoliation may lead to a partial delamination between some layers. So both phenomena lead uh, to a, a crude overestimation of the resistivity with the flex, as a, the flex thickness increases. So let us briefly summarize uh, our findings. So we demonstrated that mechanical exfoliation can be achieved with flex thickness down to buffer unit cell. Secondly, we showed that all the measured flakes were metallic and served in contrast with uh, chemically exfoliated maxims. Here, the process offers the possibility to keep the potentially useful layer layers. So let us uh, leave mechanical exfoliation. Now I would like to address a particular example of how single crystal can be used to improve our knowledge of chemical exfoliation. So let us first describe our system. We start from a centimeter sized V2LC single crystals and we pattern square pillars at the top surface. To do so, we use photolithography on the strong plasma chain involving BCL3 and chlorine in order to reach the crystal surface. So we finally get pillars on top of the crystals. We cite dimensions from a few microns to a few hundreds of microns. Then we etch them with HF and get well-defined maxim pillars are, are as shown in the image here. And why do we do this? In fact, most maxims are obtained by etching powders with variable grain size and properties, and not that much is known about the elementary processes governing etching. So our single crystals could allow us to shed some light on that. So in order to get access to intrinsic parameters, a, a third thing to avoid these defects which can be either a, a structural defects such as a dislocation, but also internal stress. Hopefully such defects are easy to detect. What we see here is a top view with two large pillars separated by uh, the trench uh, uh, in the middle of the image. So as HF exposition time increasing, increases, ECM views show that exfoliation preferentially starts from defects pre-existing close to the edges, and an interesting feature is that the main ripples follow a, a specific crystal axis. So such, such pillars must be eliminated for further characterization. 
And uh, so what happens in uh, less defective or stress-free PRs on top, we can see a optical microscope views of a stress-free PRs at different times of, uh, of HF etching. At the bottom, we see the corresponding SEM views and uh, it's uh, worth noticing two key points. On the one hand, it's clear that etching takes place just from the edges of the pillars and progressively extends with time towards the pillar center. So this indicates that no etching takes place by HF penetration through the AB planes. So HF penetration essentially takes place through the air layers. On the other hand, we can see that the etching proceeds more or less uniformly independent of uh, crystal orientation. So in order to confirm pillar conversion into my science, we use uh, two complementary techniques. The first one is a chemical analysis as a function of position. So the graphs here show the detection of the vanadium, aluminum, and fluor elements for different etching times. Have a look at the vanadium profiles on the left. Nothing changes much with time. And in contrast, we clearly see that the aluminum content decreases more and more with time, the dip in aluminum density starting from the pillar edges and progressively extending towards the center. This trend is exactly mirrored by the evolution of uh, the fluor content. So the final proof that there is no HF penetration through the AB planes is given by Harman spectroscopy. So in all figures, the spectra are measured at a given position, but uh, for uh, different etching times. Let us have a look at the top left Harman spectra. They were measured at the blue spot position right in the center of the pillar, and as expected, the signature observed at all times takes place in the middle of the pillars. The same can be said from a point located uh, uh, <coughs> at the bottom of a pillar inside the fringe. And in contrast, uh, a spot measured very close, so here, very close to the edges, demonstrates that after six hours, conversion into my synth is already complete. So uh, I will not detail the positions of each peak, but the spectra observed here in the high energy range all corresponds to the V2C max in signature. Finally, let us examine uh, the bottom left figure where the selected spot is close to the edge, but not as close as the previous one. Then we see that uh, uh, the spectrum after six hours still corresponds to the max phase. And the uh, uh, effective conversion takes place later on. So an additional important point is given by inspecting the spectra in uh, the infrared energy range, so here. Uh, where we can detect two peaks which are a characteristics of carbonization. So this contribution clearly increases with time, and it's important because it indicates that the etching time is too long. Then we also graphitize the maxim layers. Now let us monitor the advancement of the chemical conversion with time. So uh, in the graph uh, at the left, we report the etching distance versus etching time for a number of stress-free PRs. So we can observe an initially more or less linear increase followed uh, by a saturation. At room temperature, the etching rate is around 2.2 microns per hour. A key point is that independently of the initial pillar size, the conversion process saturates around 40 microns. And this gives us an upper bound for our grain size when we want to synthesize maxim from max phase powders. Now let me make a real last point about the graphitization of the maxim layers. So in the case of VDLC, it is indeed a major concern. If we now have a look at the right graph, it plots a ratio between one maxim-related peak and one carbon-related peak as a function of uh, etching time. And we can see that graphitization may occur even after, uh, after a few hours of etching and does not saturate even after 40 hours. This implies that if one wants to produce large area maxim flakes, flakes then one must face the fact that partial graphitization becomes unavoidable. So let us summarize the findings related to our uh, second uh, example. So first, using single crystals, we demonstrated uh, uh, that, uh, uh, well, sorry, first using single crystal, we demonstrated that HF penetration and etching uh, 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 essentially take place through facets oriented perpendicularly to the basal planes. So the latter, uh, the latter being mostly immune to HF penetration. Secondly, the etching rate is initially uh, linear at around uh, 2.2 microns per hour, but slows down considerably 
at distances uh, larger than 40 microns. And as the HF process uh, gradually leads to a partial carbonization. So, uh, uh, no, uh, here is my uh, general conclusion on some prospects. So, uh, also, uh, there is no real application right now. Single crystals are useful to maximum research just because they can be used as model systems for addressing questions that cannot be straightforwardly answered from the use of maxine materials issued from max face powder. And secondly, uh, I hope to uh, have convinced you that single crystals can be used for mechanical exfoliation. And uh, in the near future, uh, we, we would like to use them for uh, producing original electron devices. So I'm done. I thank you for uh, your attention and uh, I'm open to questions. Thanks a lot to me for this very interesting talk. Um, so we have multiple questions. Um, first, uh, there are a couple of questions about the remaining aluminum in, the, in case of the mechanical exfoliation. Uh, one question is about the, what are the tiny dots on the AFM images? I think I know the answer, but I won't hear it from you. Okay, so uh, the, the tiny dots on uh, the AFM are not related to aluminum in here but they are related to glue residues. So uh, for producing a, a mechanical exfoliation, it's, it is indeed much more difficult than for graphene. So we need to use adhesive tapes, which are much stronger than those used for producing graphene by mechanical exfoliation. Typically, uh, to fix an order of magnitude, uh, the adhesive strength of uh, the adhesive tape we use is uh, around of all varies from four to five newton per meter. Uh, the one which is used in the case of graphene is, uh, is in the range of two. So uh, we do have glue residues and uh, this is mostly what, what is seen at the surface. And it is indeed, indeed a major problem, for instance, for producing omicron. So have you tried to do etching um for the surface afterward with plasma or other techniques for cleaning? Yeah, so uh, we tried that. We also tried UHV uh, annealing in order to get rid of the glue, for instance. So uh, if, if uh, you use plasma etching, uh, you need absolutely, well, you need to avoid uh, oxygen plasma just because you are going to oxidize the layers and then you cannot get any uh, ohmic contact. And uh, you need to use something else hydrogen plasma or anything else, but um, something not oxidizing the surface. Yeah, so, but ha have you tried the hydrogen or? or? We tried the hydrogen, but uh, we didn't get rid uh, of the glue. Mm -hmm. So the, okay. best, the best way we found for getting rid of most of the glue, even if we still have some residues, is to dip it in uh, acetone to use an organic based adhesive tape, not a synthetic one, to leave it for hours and then to anneal it in UHV conditions during a couple of hours. Yeah, so th there are other questions, um, as I said, about the A layer. Uh, what is the effect of A layer on electrical conductivity uh, and how to. And okay, how so to that's a good that. question. I think that's a quite a good question. I, I think essentially we keep the band structure on the Fermi level position of the max phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there is um, another question about um, after mechanical exfoliation and deposition of the flakes. Um, did you try to etch the a the aluminum layer out, chemical etching no, after the mechanical exfoliation? Well, no, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, there is another question. That, how that would be a quite a good uh, I mean, uh, thing to do, I think. Yeah, it would be interesting to see. Uh, how, long do, how long does the measurement of single double flake takes? Uh, so even uh, in ultra high vacuum, 10 to power negative 10, one finds monolayer residual gas absorption. Uh, so this should influence you're the metallicity. You're talking, about, you're talking about the STM measurement? Uh, yes, I believe so. Okay, so the STM measurements, it lasts, it's, so it's very long, it, it lasts several hours. If you want to get atomic resolution, then, uh, you need to keep them in UHV condition. But, but also about the, sorry, about the AFM, uh, the electronic 
hard when it comes, so it's in, the, it's in air all the time. It's in air, okay. Yeah, so what is important is that if, we, if you want to compare the flake, which are always metallic, with uh, uh, the SiO2 layer, which is insulating, and to get a contrast, then you need to properly ensure that uh, uh, the SiO2 top layer is not uh, hydrophilic, but it has to be prepared in uh, uh, hydrophobic conditions. So for yeah, this, we, we, we use a silanization of the, the top surface afterwards. Oh, okay. Uh, there is um, another, there are many, mo many more questions, but we don't have time, so I will, just one more question about the mechanism of graphitization that you mentioned at the end. Um, what, what is the mechanism for this that you have in mind for that uh, graphitization? And what is the form of this carbon? Um, what's the morphology? Is it graphene? Is it amorphous carbon? Is, are they particles? It's hard to say, I would say, because we didn't investigate it that much. And I think we should do more analysis, but uh, that's really hard to say. Initially, when we started, we started to uh, uh, use V2C, uh, big crystals, I mean, a centimeter size. And then we, took, we fully graphite on the top surface, and it was uh, impossible to, uh, to get any maximum. But uh, amorphous carbon, graphene, but graphite, I have no idea. Uh, the, the, the peaks, the Raman peaks are too broad. It's, it's quite difficult to uh, analyze them and to say uh, I have this form rather than another one. Okay, um, we are running out of time. Uh, just very brief question. Did you check the stoichiometry of the molybdenum based magnetic crystal? And how is the surface roughness and what about crystalline? Okay, so the crystals are rather, yeah, the, 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 the top surface uh, is, is quite, uh, uh, it is not rough at all. Here for this phase, the crystals are much smaller than for other phases. So, uh, uh, typical sizes of good crystal is several square microns only. And uh, I think that from, from the detailed X-ray diffraction analysis, stoichiometry is about right the one I gave. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tui. Uh, we are You're running welcome. out of time again, and we will convene again in uh, three minutes. Uh, so stay tuned, everyone. Thank you. Send our texts and e emails and let us post pictures and videos from almost anywhere. Antennas give us the freedom to stay on the go from highways and subways to airports and checkout lines. They are also the key for unlocking the potential of smart technology. Anything you want to communicate with, collect data from, or remotely control needs an antenna. Just imagine the things we could connect with if installing an antenna was as easy as doing a little spray painting. At Drexel University, researchers are doing just that, spraying antennas. All it takes is a few dashes of a special water-soluble titanium carbide powder called Maxine that was invented at Drexel. And a little water, just mix and voila, antenna spray. The spray on antennas work because of the Maxine material's unique ability to transmit radio waves when applied as a very thin, even invisible coating. Maxine antennas function just like the larger metal ones in phones and mobile devices, but they take up virtually no space and can turn almost any object into a fully functional transmitter with just a few sprays. Just think about all the things you'd like to spray and communicate with. Lost socks, car keys, pets. This antenna technology could help us communicate with just about anything. Okay, maybe not anything, but some really important things like roads and bridges, baby cribs, hospital gowns, and other things that help keep us safe. This research is connecting us with the world in exciting new ways, and it's only happening at Drexel. Antenna.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Um, so, I'm uh, again uh, the moderator of the session chair for today, Michael Nagib, an assistant professor in the physics and engineering physics department at Tulane University. And uh, our final keynote speaker for today uh, is uh, Professor uh, Laibatov Taito, uh, professor of physics at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute in the USA. Um, just a few logistics uh, before we start. Um, as usual, uh, all, participa all participants are in listen mode only. And uh, if you have trouble connecting with your computer uh, audio, please call one of these numbers shown here. Uh, and we'd like our session to be interactive. So feel free to uh, shoot a uh, question in the chat uh, box and I'll try to collect them and ask the speaker then. A recording and slide deck will be available on the Maxine conference website following the, following the conference. Uh, with these uh, logistics, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, Taitova, again, Taitova again, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. And okay, and begin my presentation. Okay. Uh, is my screen on? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for introduction. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to share our recent work in Maxine's. We are kind of newcomers to this field. So it's been a very, very inspiring. So uh, my name is Lubav Jatova. I am a uh, coming here from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. And what I'm gonna be talking uh, about today is our work on conductivity and the carrier transport dynamics in Maxine's in the terahertz frequency range. Okay, so um, this is the slide that you've probably seen many times. So uh, as we know, since the discovery of Maxine's eight years ago, the family is continuing to grow and this uh, slide just uh, gives you some of the possible chemistries. So in my group, what we have done so far, we have focused on three of these structures. We have looked at uh, titanium carbide and two of the molybdenum-based vaccines, and we have uh, studied their properties in the terahertz range. Before I continue presenting those results, I'd like to begin with a very brief tutorial of what terahertz spectroscopy is and what information can we get from it. So terahertz radiation, as you can see here, is somewhere between the microwave and infrared range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, effectively positioning it between the realm of electronics and photonics. So at one terahertz, the energy of a photon is only four milli electron volts. So it's a very low energy photons. What is the physics in the terahertz range? And there's actually a lot of different interesting processes with energy signatures in that range. Things like free carry absorption, phonons, polaritons, uh, also excitons, trions, and all of these different quasi-particles. So uh, this is kind of information that we can get uh, by doing terahertz spectroscopy. Uh, in my lab, we use terahertz pulses to do spectroscopy. So what you see here is an example of a terahertz pulse. And what it is, it's pretty much just a single cycle, a nearly single cycle electromagnetic transient. Right? Uh, we can generate it using optical rectification in a zinc a telluride nonlinear crystal. We can detect it also using optically gated technique of their electro-optic sampling in the second zinc telluride crystal. So the important things here is that this pulse is because of the short duration of the pulse, it is quite broad range. So if we do Fourier transform and look at the power spectrum in case of the pulses in our lab, their bandwidth extends almost all the way to two and a half, three terahertz. Uh, the other important uh, point here is that what you are seeing here is electric field as a function of time rather than intensity. So the detection here is coherent, which allows us to retain the information about both the amplitude and the phase. Thus, we get a lot more information that we would by just measuring intensity. Uh, finally, the very short duration of terahertz pulses makes it uh, ideal to use for pump probe measurements. Okay, so, 
Uh, this is their very uh, simple a schematic diagram of the way we do what we call terahertz time domain spectroscopy experiments, which allow us to study intrinsic properties. And what I mean here by intrinsic is their properties without external uh, excitation, right? So what we have here, we have those terahertz pulses at normal incidence focused on the sample and then uh, detected in transmission mode. So uh, this is the examples of what information we would get out of it. So you have their terahertz pulse transmitted without a sample or maybe just through a substrate. And uh, we can also then place the sample into the beam and record the second waveform that goes through the sample. What information that gives us? Well, we analyze it in the frequency domain by looking at both the amplitude and the phase of both of these pulses and by applying quite simple analysis based on Fresnel equations, what we can get directly uh, without any Kramer's uh, chronic analysis is uh, a set of complex frequency resolved optical parameters. Things like refractive index and um, absorption coefficient, or alternatively, this is there, uh, what we would like to use is complex conductivity. Okay. Uh, final note here is Another very important point to keep in mind is the length scale for probing carrier motion in this case. And this length scale is quite uh, short. And the reason for that is this is their, sort of the way to estimate uh, what are the distances uh, that we're probing. And that is related to the diffusion coefficient and the frequency of the probing uh, pulse here. And that is just the distance. How far can the carrier get away before the field that you're applying reverses direction? So that tells us all of this combined gives us um, this approach as a nearly ideal non-contact probe of conductivity, which is very useful for nanomaterials where we would um, not like to apply electrical contacts. Okay, so uh, the another way we can look at the properties here is by introducing photo excitation and using the fact that terahertz pulse is uh, very short in duration. So this is the diagram of that experiment. And the only thing that changed here is we added this additional optical excitation. Right? In this case, uh, one way to look at what is happening here is, well, we can just record change in transmission of their terahertz probe pulse as a function of pump probe time delay, right? So this is your typical pump probe um, configuration. So it can be shown in this case that the negative change in transmission as a function of time is directly proportional to photoconductivity or to photoinduced changes in the conductivity. What I'm showing you here is an example of just your uh, bulk silicon crystal shown in red as well as the nanostructured silicon shown in black. And as the pump pulse arises, uh, arrives at the sample, we inject for curious conductivity goes up, and then we can look at dynamics of it decaying down. Okay, the other way uh, we can do those measurements is actually fix a, a pump probe delay. And instead of just looking at the peak, which gives us an overall picture, because that's where all the frequencies are in phase, we're able to um, resolve the entire waveform and look at their changes in the photoconductivity at that time, frequency results. This is an example for bulk silicon, six picoseconds after photo excitation. So the red symbols here uh, represent real conductivity component. Um, blue symbols are imaginary conductivity component. And uh, of course, to make any sense out of it or to get useful information, we need to apply an appropriate uh, model to fit this experimental data. And for bulk crystals, like semiconductors, as well as metals, your simple phenomenological Druda model works really well. And those are their line fits here. From the Druda model, uh, we can get things like instantaneous photo, photo excited carrier density, as well as the scattering time, which if we know effective mass, allows us to measure mobility of their carriers at that time. So that's kind of their uh, little tutorial of how we do those measurements that we have now applied to Matisse. Okay, so now, now let's move on to our work in Matisse. Okay, so those are the three 
samples that we have looked at. Right? And of course, uh, before we go to terahertz properties, let's briefly review what is already known about their conductivity measured by conventional ways. So this is just an example of uh, some of their beautiful data recently published by Don and our collaborators for titanium carbide. And what we know for, about titanium carbide, the films can have very high conductivity. Uh, they are metallic, so based on their temperature uh, dependence. And also with by annealing them, you can further improve conductivity by releasing the water molecules as well as some ions that get trapped in between uh, their Van der Waals layers. Uh, when we look at one of those um, lipidum based vaccines, so uh, MOLI2 titanium C2, uh, we find that initially as deposited uh, films have a sign of their uh, resist resistance in this case um, as a function of temperature, which kind of makes it looks like a semiconductor, uh, except when they anneal those uh, samples, uh, finally you recover the metallic response once you remove all those intercalated uh, species or most of those intercalated species. So it tells us that the intraflake transport is actually uh, metallic. However, the long range transport um, that is illustrated here is limited by intraflake uh, long variable range hopping, as it was suggested recently in this paper by Halim. Okay, so what do we see in the terror? So the first material we've looked at was uh, titanium carbide. This work was done in collaboration with a group um, of uh, Wademo Challen at uh, Missouri Science and Technology. So for this work, um, their 25 nanometer thick film was prepared by dip coating on the quartz substrate. So this is a representative two by two micron AFM image and it shows that this film is continuous and consists of overlapping nanoflakes of about sub-micron lateral dimensions. So this here, what I'm showing you is their um, optical transmission with this uh, spectrum and it shows you that the transmission of the film varies between 60 and 70 percent in this visible range. Okay, so we have, of course, investigated the properties of this film using terahertz spectroscopy in the transmission configuration. Uh, so this is, these are the results that we find. First of all, here, those are their terahertz pulses transmitted through just the quartz substrate here, as well as maxine on quartz substrate. And you can see from here that this relatively thin, only 25 nanometer thick film, considerably attenuates terahertz pulses. You can also see that by looking at their electric field am amplitude attenuation. Uh, when we uh, look at their resulting frequency result conductivity in the terahertz range, what we find first of all is that once we extrapolate it to the DC, it does give us that um, quite high DC conductivity that we expect. But of course, the spectrum itself looks not drew like. Uh, this is uh, the shape of conductivity is something we routinely see in many other nanostructured materials, which have some sort of structure that impedes carrier motion uh, over a length scale that are comparable to their mean free path. And it can be really well described by their modification, a slight modification to the Trude model called Drude Smith model, which just introduces one more additional parameter C. This parameter C varies from negative one to zero. At zero, of course, we recover through the model, and at negative one, uh, what we have is the carriers that are kind of locked into some um, short, over short distances, uh, probably by grain boundaries or defects where they can freely move within the grains, but they cannot uh, move over uh, long distances. Okay, so what do we see here when we apply this model? In this particular case, the C parameter is negative, approximately negative 0.7. So that tells us that the grain boundaries, they are likely their edges of flake, do play an important role. However, there is still considerable long range transport. This is um, in our previous work on vaccines back in tw uh, 2018, we looked at a similar film, however, it was discontinuous. And in that case, we did get C parameter that was almost negative once. So that tells you the power of this technique to really zoom in and looking at 
uh, short range versus long range conductivity. Okay. Also from these bits, what we can get is we can estimate carrier density and we get that carrier density is on an order of 2 to 10 to the uh, 21 inverse centimeter cube comparable to the published footage values. We can also calculate intrinsic mobility of charge carriers. That's the mobility within those grains, right? And we find that it's also quite high. Okay. So uh, this high attenuation of terahertz by uh, Maxine suggests that it can be used uh, in their electromagnetic interference shielding in the terahertz range. We've already heard some talks and there's been some beautiful work uh, from a Drexel, a group of uh, Yuri Gogotze uh, looking at electromagnetic interference in the gigahertz range. And here we are looking at the higher frequency. Uh, so previously, um, theoretical work by Jean and collaborators have demonstrated or they have predicted that stacked titanium carbide is should have quite high absorption coefficient in, um, in the terahertz range. And indeed, what we calculate from our data, we get that their uh, absorption coefficient is very close to the predicted um, values, maybe only a factor of two smaller. We can also calculate electromagnetic shielding efficiency. And we find that for the thin film of only two and a half, uh, 25 nanometers, we get approximately two and a half decibels of attenuation. So hopefully by scaling it up, we can get to much higher values in this case, okay? So the very important, uh, very interesting things happened when we started looking at optically induced um, properties of photoconductivity. So in this case, uh, we've brought an additional beam and we've excited titanium carbide um, with either 800 or 400 nanometer pulses. So what we saw here surprised us. What we saw was that the photo excitation with both of these wavelengths, 800 nanometers as well as 400 nanometers, actually enhances transmission of terahertz pulses. So what you see here is a relative change in transmission, right, which will correspond to actually suppressing conductivity. Um, what we find that this effect lasts for a very long time. It lasts for nanoseconds, as you can see here, better on their uh, log scale. Here, uh, it's, the data is pretty much just limited by our delay stage, right? And also, we find that the peak of this effect is linear in uh, fluence that we have used. Okay, so has this been seen before? Uh, what does it actually mean? Uh, first of all, uh, when, we, uh, when we look at the change in their electromagnetic interference shielding as a function of time after photo excitation, we find that electromagnetic interference shielding is suppressed over the entire bandwidth. And that is due to their suppressed, so the negative change in the conductivity also over this entire bandwidth. And so has been seen before, yes. Uh, transient increase in terahertz transmission has been observed before in metallic graphene, which is another 2D material, has been extensively studied by several groups. I'm showing here uh, some of their, um, those results. And uh, what they find there in, in case of graphene, in case of specifically metallic graphene, uh, the transient photoconductivity suppression is due to the thermalization of the hot carriers. They, when you inject hot carriers, they very rapidly thermalize with the entire electron population. It lowers the chemical potential and as a result reduces uh, conductivity. Uh, the same thing happens in conventional method, uh, metals. So they increase carrier scattering due to uh, enhanced carrier carrier and carrier uh, lattice scattering. Um, as the lattice is uh, heating. So is this something that we expect to happen in vaccines as well? And this was something we tried to answer, right? So if we uh, briefly take a look at their band structure and the density of states uh, here, I apologize for the noise. Something's going on there. Uh, so if we look at that, 
we can see that both 800 nanometer and uh, 400 nanometer pulses are able to generate hot periods both by intra-band as well as inter-band period excitation. Of course, what we expect is that over a few picoseconds due to carrier-carrier scattering and carrier-phonon scattering, we expect the lattice temperature to increase, right? So is this there? Is what we have seen just the laser induced transient heating changing there or uh, reducing the conductivity? Well, if we, uh, as we look back at their conventionally measured uh, conductivity in vaccines, specifically in this vaccine, as a function of temperature, we see that the dependence on temperature is uh, not very strong. And once we've taken this film and we cooled it down from room temperature all the way down to the I apologize, not 80, 95 uh, Kelvin, we see that the conductivity is essentially unchanged. Right? So that sort of made us uh, doubt that what we see here is, is uh, dependent on uh, temperature. So as we, uh, well, uh, if, as we compare the electromagnetic interference shielding measured both at room temperature as well as at 95 uh, degrees Kelvin, we see that they are pretty much uh, undistinguishable. What's even more interesting is the dynamics of the changes. As we increase their transmission of terahertz and then it recovers, the dynamics are also unchanged by changing temperature quite significantly. So um, what we believe here is while most certainly photo excitation will increase lattice temperature, we do not think at this point that uh, this increase in temperature is playing a major role in uh, conductivity suppression in metallic vaccines, unlike in graphene and unlike in conventional methods. So uh, this is where we would certainly welcome help from any theorists uh, in the audience who have ideas of what we should be looking at. Uh, I do believe that determination might play an important role in these effects, and this is something that should be investigated further. However, even uh, without fully understanding what is going on, we believe that uh, there can be some very interesting applications where we would like to change the transmission or we would like to change their electromagnetic interference shielding dynamically for a short uh, periods of time for an seconds. Okay. So uh, let's move on and let me uh, briefly describe our work that we have done um, on the other two vaccines, on molybdenum-based vaccines in collaboration uh, with a group of uh, Michelle Ipsum and Drexel. Okay. So uh, I have described their titanium carbide uh, data before. In case of there, these are the structures of the two, uh, MOLY2 titanium 2C3 and MOLY2 titanium C2 films. Uh, so in case of uh, this material, we had an 80 nanometer of uh, thick film. In case of this one with high molybdenum uh, content, the film was much thicker because the conductivity is much lower and that was required for us to get a reasonable signal to noise. Okay, so uh, the arrow here is showing the increase in molybdenum content. So here we have uh, no uh, molybdenum, here we have one uh, moly, to one titanium, and here it is two for each uh, titanium. The first question to ask is, well, how do intrinsic properties, intrinsic conditions change? So this was the data that I showed you uh, previously on just titanium carbide, uh, and these are their TDS spec or TDS uh, conductivity in the terahertz range for the two moly containing vaccines. First of all, both of them, Drew Smith's model, also describes their conductivity well, telling us that their grain boundaries or their edges of those flakes play a very important role in limiting the long range transport. Uh, also, the overall conductivity, as you can see here, changes a lot. So it's significantly lower in this material and keeps decreasing as we introduce more molybdenum. And this is something that is in line with the conventional uh, studies. Uh, while they're C parameter and their uh, scattering time is dependent on film morphology. What we can do is we can um, estimate the carrier density here. Uh, as far as we know, uh, their 
effective masses for these materials have not yet been calculated. So we have just estimated the carrier density, assuming that their effective mass is equal to electron mass. And what we get is, as we are going along this um, arrow with increasing moly content, we're reducing the carrier density by order of magnitude here, by order one more order of magnitude and one more order of magnitude. Of course, if the carrier uh, effective mass is closer to this one, then this uh, change would be even more dramatic. Okay, so what do we see in terms of the photo excitation? And this is where things also get quite interesting because what we find is that their sign of their photo induced changes is different. Before in titanium carbide, shown here in red, we saw that photo, uh, photo excitation suppresses conductivity. However, in moly-based mixine, we see enhanced conductivity. Uh, again, what we believe is happening is that even though uh, this material is also metallic, but it has a lower intrinsic carrier density, so maybe intraband excitation of, of a population of new free carriers is a dominant effect. When we compare their uh, behavior of two of these, so with uh, lower moly content relative to titanium and higher, we see that increase in molybdenum fraction suppresses the peak photoconductivity. So uh, this data was taken at exactly the same conditions, right? So the peak photoconductivity is uh, increased, but also the lifetime is dramatically different. Uh, it appears that their moly 2 titanium C2 film has much higher density of trap states that are able to trap those extra photo excited carriers, making their lifetime, the lifetime of photo excited carriers there significantly lower. And the final thing that I want to just briefly mention is we also looked at the effect of annealing on terahertz properties and specifically on their uh, time resolved uh, effect. So we know from previous uh, published works and from previous studies that annealing, even at mild temperatures, releases some of the trapped species and uh, also decreases the spacing and improves conductivity. So we have annealed both of these moly uh, films, uh, moly 2 uh, titanium 2 C3 shown here on the top and moly 2 titanium uh, C2 shown here on the bottom. So what we find is that annealing somewhat improves intrinsic interflate transport and also long range conductivity in this material, in moly 2 titanium 2 C3. That is evidenced by their C parameter, which tells us just how uh, confined the carriers are to their flakes. Uh, it gets less negative, but it has very little effect on the other mixine. Uh, the major effect that we saw was again on the photoconductivity. So in both of these uh, cases, what we see that annealing had very minor effect on the peak photoconductivity, right? So on the, on the initial injection of uh, carries contributing to photoconductivity, what, they, what annealing did do was significantly change their photoconductivity dynamics. We can see it especially here for molybdenum 2, titanium uh, carbide 2. We see that their lifetime, especially over the long uh, time scale, improves dramatically, right? So what we believe the slow component is due to is the trapping of those carriers in um, some defect trap states. On, and uh, we believe that annealing removes some of the species that act as traps. So the previous works have uh, demonstrated that as uh, the etching, the process of etching that is required to prepare mixine films can introduce some defects and vacancies in their film, films themselves. And uh, molybdenum is more, molybdenum containing mixines are more prone to formation of those defects. So in, in this case, there would be more molybdenum uh, atoms there and it might result in higher density of defects that translates into their changes that we see. But of course this is also work in progress and uh, stay tuned for more studies. So let me just summarize what we have seen so far was that titanium uh, carbide 
uh, vaccines have very high terahertz conductivity and show promise for terahertz electromagnetic interference shielding with dynamical control over shielding efficiency. Right? In terms of moly vaccines, we found that they have lower carrier density, they have different response to photoexcitation, their optoelectronic properties are sensitive to the presence of interpolated species, therefore they show promise for chemical sensing. And overall, we see that it's possible to engineer terahertz conductivity as well as carrier dynamics and photoresponse by choice of the chemistry, ordering, and also by controlling intercount. So um, finally, I would like to thank uh, people who made this work possible. Uh, my a student, Guanjian Li, who's done most of these measurements, uh, some internal funding by uh, WPI collaborators. Um, Michelle Bersum at Drexel University, Vadim Machalin at Missouri SMT, uh, Frank Hagman at the University of Alberta in Canada, and a group of Dmitry Turchinovich at the University of Bielefeld in Germany. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for this great talk, uh, Professor Tektova. Um, we have actually many questions, and hopefully we can go over them quickly. Um, so uh, there is a general question in the beginning, uh, says non-contact methods for propping conductivity and semiconductors are highly valuable. Can this terahertz uh, specific method can be used for propping semiconductors or is reserved, uh, reserved for propping metals only? Uh, we routinely measure uh, semiconductor properties and especially semiconducting nanostructures is uh, where for things like uh, nanotubes or nanowire conductors because you can put them across the bandwidth. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, the voice was broken a little bit. Oh, but sorry, I my internet were... connection is a bit like. But I think we got the answer. It it, it has yeah. been measured. Yes. Yes. Um, there's a. Uh, Two questions, we can bundle them together. What is the environment for the measurement? Uh, these it's measurements, air. yes, these measurements were done in air, and that is a little bit of a problem uh, for us because <clears throat> terahertz radiation is strongly um, absorbed by any presence of water vapor in the air. So in the future measurements, we would like to purge it uh, in on dry nitrogen, and we expect improvements, yeah. Um, the other question, do the ultra, uh, ultra short, intense and repeated pulses heat the sample locally? Uh, did you estimate the temperature rise? Um, we, in principle, can, but their uh, pulses are very short and not so powerful. Also, uh, the films are thin and they are sitting on quartz and there have been some recent works uh, actually by Drexel groups looking at uh, thermal conductivity. So quartz uh, is, uh, has, a, I think, high uh, thermal conductivity and it, uh, the heat dissipates very quickly in this case. So. Great. Um, so there's, um, have you checked the effect of flake size on the terahertz behavior of Maxine? Because you mentioned about the interlayer or intralayer effect. Yes, yes. In terms of, so for example, in, uh, in the case of titanium carbide, we've looked at uh, two different sets of samples. Um, and in the one case that I haven't showed data from, their uh, flakes were smaller and they were um, you know, uh, not, not overlapping. And, we, and as opposed to their other sample where they were larger and the coverage was nearly complete and we do see the difference. We see that the carrier density is the same as expected, but their uh, mobility of the carriers, long range mobility, is strongly affected by uh, morphology. So, yes. Um, there, was a, there was another question. Did you consider the effect of, inter, of intercalating agents uh, used for delamination and thus uh, results that, that you have? Uh, yes, that's uh, that was uh, their reason for their study as a function of annealing, right? Our so as we can see that as so far as I said, this is a work in progress. We have annealed only at 200 uh, Celsius, which is kind of a mild anneal, but we definitely see, especially um, in their, uh, the uh, Maxine was more uh, moly content. 
we see dramatic improvement in the carrier lifetime. So we believe that something, those species intercalated in their gaps might act as traps for photoexcited carriers, and we see the dramatic improvement of that. Okay, um, this answered another question about what is the origin of trapped states, but you already answered this. Um, that's, that's just one, one possibility. There might be also the defects inside their films themselves, like vacancies. Can you comment on the surface scattering effect on your measurement? Uh, you mean that this uh, scattering from this, the surface itself? Well, um, it, it's probably what we see, this, the scattering we see is a combined effect of all the different scattering mechanisms. But one thing to keep in mind that uh, we're measuring at normal incidence in the flakes, so we're we are coming in with an uh, electric field pulse, which just kind of sloshes the electrons inside this film but the direction of electric field is parallel to the surface. So we're kind of shaking them inside there, right? So. Um, there is one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question. Uh, do you consider the possibility of chemical reactions that could change the chemical state of moly 2 tic 2 during annealing? For example, intercalated water may partially hydrolyze maxine. So. Is this quite it is quite possible, and this is something that we're hopefully will look into. Yes. With this, uh, I'd like to thank you again for this great talk, and I'd like to thank all the speakers and all the participants for um, joining us today. I'd like to, rem uh, to remind the, atten the attendees that tomorrow we will start at 8:30 Eastern Time, and register attendees will receive a new link shortly because there was a mistake about starting at 8 or 8.30. But we are starting at 8.30 Eastern time. I will be giving a talk uh, about the intercalation effect and I'll also give a brief, very short uh, history of discovery. How, how did the Maxine discovery happen in the first place? I think it would be interesting. Uh, please stay tuned and uh, have a good day. able to be how am i preparing for a changing world how am i how am i how am i preparing for a changing world the future of my industry is automation artificial intelligence machine learning i think environmental engineering will see a greater investment in renewable energy the future of healthcare graphic design entrepreneurship cybersecurity is a growing field the medical community is realizing the need to include environmental factors social factors and the interplay that has with a person's physical health no matter what field you're working in the most important thing that will drive our industries forward is combining them. For me, I found that Drexel had a lot of investment in current trends in an environment that is constantly changing. Students get an idea of what real world assignments are going to be like. The second we leave the classroom and enter into a co-op or into employment after college, we are prepared for real life. After graduation, I have an extra boost ahead of different people that may have only had short internships or no real world experience at all. You get to network with the people working in the field and you get new perspectives that you cannot just get by sitting in your classroom. I got the opportunity to work with professors and PhD students. It allowed me to see where I could be 10 years from now. My co-op advisor was instrumental in how to really hone in on what made me different from the other applicants. Reviewing my resumes, doing interview prep. And even when I was on co-op, she would check in with me and give me more advice on how to get the most out of my experience. When I returned to the classroom after co-op, I found that I was more confident. I came in with more insight. I was able to ask deeper questions. Once I went on co-op, I was able to connect these concepts that we would learn in class with real life examples. I was the lead on two projects while I was on co-op. And now when I came back to the classroom, I was able to be a resource. You're no longer thinking of this class as just something you have to get through to graduate from college. It makes you a better student from the sense that you actually want to learn the information more. Through my co-op, I found out that not only technical skills are important, even soft skills are important. Co-op has pushed me to work harder, but also produce work that I can be proud of.
even though I don't yet have any letters behind my name, I still feel comfortable in a work setting, speaking up and giving my opinions. Knowing the kinds of things I like and I don't like. It's helped me shape how I want my career after graduation to go. Meeting people from diverse backgrounds actually taught me a lot about all the different changes that were happening in industry, where the industry was moving. The technical skills learned in the classroom and the six month co-op both have prepared me for the changing world. Drexel really has a allowed me to explore many different interests, combine subjects, and really build my own education. I have no concerns with life after college.